Jim, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Okay, Tom. Well, uh, I uh, am a full-time author, blogger. I, I did make the transition from writing books to uh, making a living on the internet writing political blogs. And that was fortunate for me because a lot of people can't make that transition. And the book business is sort of uh, getting kind of janky. Um, I started out as a newspaper reporter uh, when I was a young man. Uh, I got hired uh, by Rolling Stone to be an editor there. Uh, I didn't like it very much. And I was about, I was at a kind of critical point in my life where I had to decide, uh, you know, which way to go. And, and the programming for young people with literary aspirations at the time was to write novels. So I dropped out of Rolling Stone, rode a motorcycle back home, back east, settled in upstate New York and cranked out about eight novels and had a wonderful time living in upstate New York. Uh, but I didn't get rich and famous. And I was still waiting on tables after publishing eight novels with major mainstream publishers. So that was kind of a, cr a midlife crisis. But then um, I kind of uh, lucked into some assignments from the New York Times Magazine. And I turned one of them into a book proposal that got picked up by Simon & Schuster. And it was a book about things I had been uh, uh, ruminating on for many years about the fiasco of suburbia and suburban sprawl and the whole issue. And I wrote a book about, about it called The Geography of Nowhere. It became kind of a cult classic in the architecture and planning schools. And when I was writing that, uh, you know, I, I realized uh, it dawned on me that we were heading into a, a reckoning with uh, our economy and with the especially fossil fuels and um, particularly oil. You couldn't fail to notice. Well, what, what really happened was at the end of the 1990s, the many senior geologists in the oil industry started retiring and publishing their dark secret thoughts in the obscure industry journals. And in earlier times, they would have been ignored by the public because they were obscure journals. But the internet had just blossomed. And a lot of this information went into the general public and thus developed the peak oil story, which got a lot of people's attention. It got my attention. I wrote a series of books about, about where we're going, starting with The Long Emergency, came out in 2005. And that was about these converging catastrophes that we're now really entering uh, at cruising speed. And I wrote a sequel to it called uh, Too Much Magic. And the subtitle of that was um, Wishful Thinking, Technology, and the Fate of the Nation. And uh, I published a series of four novels under the, the banner of the World Made by Hand novels. It was the title of the first book in the series. And they depicted what it would be like to live in uh, America after the kind of economic crash that I predicted in the long emergency. And so there were four of those novels. And, uh, you know, and I, I write a political blog called Clusterfuck Nation. Um, I, I remain a registered Democrat, oddly enough, although I inveigh uh, forcefully against what I now call the party of chaos. Um, you know, I'm kind of uh, politically independent, I'd say. And there you have it. I live in upstate New York still. And um, yeah. Awesome. So could you tell us more about um, surviving the long emergency? What is the long emergency? What are the catastrophes that you mentioned that so we are colliding into in this generation? And what do you think are the causes of those problems? Well, uh, the fossil fuel problem is uh, simply a resource depletion problem. And, you know, it doesn't happen all at once. It happens in different parts of the world and at different rates. And, and it begins to sort of destabilize uh, advanced industrial economies. And uh, it's, you know, there's a long story about how the picture of it developed, but where we're at now is, you know, we really ran into trouble about 2008 in the USA. We were importing, 
we were using about 20 million barrels a day of oil and importing about 15 million barrels a day and producing a little bit under 5 million barrels a day. We had gone from a peak of 10 million barrels a day in 1970 to 5 million barrels a day by 2007, eight or so. And uh, uh, then fracking came along and fracking was kind of a, uh, and by the way, in 2008, you know, that we started to see great instability in the price of oil and that in turn destabilized the, the uh, on the ground economy and especially the banking economy, because there's a tremendous connection between finance and the energy inputs into our system. And when you disturb the en energy inputs, then you end up with a disturbed financial and banking picture. So that uh, is what led to the collapse of 2008-9. And then frac fracking started almost, uh, you know, in lockstep with with that and really, really got underway. It was a, not a new technology, but it had been previously done with, you know, nitroglycerin. And now they started to do it with high pressure water, with uh, keeping the uh, cracks in the fractured rock open with sand particles. It was a, a new technology. It was also very expensive. And the way for people to understand the business model for this is that uh, the old conventional oil, uh, the wells used to cost about $400,000 in today's money to drill and begin production. And they produced thousands of barrels a day for decades. This is like the conventional oil of Oklahoma, Texas, etc. The the shale oil, the wells cost between six and twelve million dollars per well in today's money. They produce maybe a hundred to two hundred barrels a day for the first year, and after that, their production falls off by sixty percent generally. And after three or four years, they're done. And uh, the economics of uh, shale oil are pretty poor. It, it was it happened because uh, really of zero interest rate policy, and that prompted investors to be desperate to look for something they could put their money in that would promise more than you know one tenth of a percent of interest. And a lot of them were snookered into shale oil investments. It, it attracted a tremendous amount of investment. The hype was, was fantastic. And they actually produced a tremendous amount of oil doing it for 10 years or so, for a decade. And American production went from, you know, under 5 million barrels a day to just under 13 million barrels a day, which was a new peak. It was very high. Uh, meanwhile, uh, mind you, we were still using 20 million barrels a day, which means somewhere in there we were still importing a lot of oil. And um, what happened was the shale oil producers demonstrated in that 10 year period that they couldn't make any money producing shale oil. OK, so uh, uh, now we're in a situation where shale is having a hard time attracting new investment. Um, uh, they're having a hard time continuing the scale of their operations that allowed them to produce all that oil for 10 years. And we're now entering a period of great banking and financial instability, the result of which will be a lot less capital to direct into the shale oil project. So shale oil, as far as I can see, is pretty much done. It's not all happening at once, but you know, production is down from 2018, 19, and probably permanently down. It's an, it's hard to say what the glide path is going to be. I think it's going to be fairly quick, not you know, not one year, not two, three years, but it's going to be you know, before well before 2030. We're not going to be producing a whole lot of shale oil anymore, unless you know we we nationalize it. And the danger with nationalizing an oil industry, as demonstrated by Venezuela and to some extent by Mexico, is that all of a sudden, you know, you, you, where, where you once had competence in private companies, uh, you now have uh, the bureaucratic governmental incompetence running a very important industry. And, you know, the, the likelihood is that they'll run it into the ground. So we're really at an inflection point. 
Uh, now, the problem is uh, we're not going to be able to stop using fossil fuels overnight. And um, uh, we're not going to, you know, the additional problem is we're simply not going to run all of our shit on any combination of alternative energies, at least the ones that are known. And uh, that was the subject of my book, um, Too Much Magic, which was about we had we had entered this national period of wishful thinking. And uh, the alt energy scene was a big part of the wishful thinking agenda. It still is, you know, as reflected in the Green New Deal and all the BS around that. And um, the fact is, we're not going to run uh, Walmart, Walt Disney World, the interstate highway system, the suburbs, uh, the U.S. military on any combination of wind, solar, used French fry oil uh, or dark matter or things that have not been demonstrated to be useful yet. So we're in a quandary. Uh, you know, I, I don't happen to be a, a friend of the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab, but the fact is we are in for a reset. It's just not going to be the reset that Klaus Schwab is uh, promoting. You know, his uh, techno nirvana of robots and, and the common folk eating bugs and the economic elites uh, living in luxury and the world population being reduced, uh, uh, um, you know, by, uh, deliberately, which seems to be going on now. It's going to be a different disposition of things. You know, we're, if, if this Green New Deal nonsense continues, we're only going to hasten uh, uh, our retreat into a, a downscaled uh, uh, way of life. And it's going to be a very disorderly retreat. That's the problem. You know, we are, our destination is a world that is much more local and, and in which our activities are much downscaled from what they are now. You know, we're, we're going to have to find some way to produce things and we're going to have to find some way to heat the places where we live and power the stuff that we do. Um, but we're, it's going to be a heck of a lot less power than we're used to. Um, and what we're facing really is kind of a, a time out from what we have experienced as this tremendous surge of technocratic technological progress. And uh, the question is, are we going to land on our feet at a, at a reduced and kind of sane level of uh, daily life, or are we going to plunge into a dark age? And uh, if the authorities, the people running things, keep on going the way they are now, we're, it's going to be a dark age. And uh, that's, that's the long emergency. And uh, uh, it's really gotten up to speed now. We're about to see, I think, uh, quite a few... Uh, pretty challenging changes in just the next, you know, 36 months ahead. And uh, we're going to look back on the time that we've been living in the last five years as, uh, you know, the last uh, period of great comfort and convenience. Well, so a few things you mentioned there. Uh, the first one was about the nationalized oil. So we know that there's many countries in um, the Europe, like Norway, that has a large portion of the oil nationalized, 60 to 80 percent. And many of those countries, and those do extremely well, um, very successful, unlike Venezuela and some of the, the worst examples. And so it seems like we could use those as a model to nationalize oil in America rather successfully. But I well, think we could hope to. We could hope to. But, you know, we, one of the things we forget is Norway is a really small country. You know, I think I believe they have fewer than 10 million people in their whole population. And they're they're doing this thing at a scale uh, that is much smaller and in a region that is very, uh, you know, uh, a very small part of the North Sea. And why that's does the all. size matter? <clears throat> Pardon? Because why, why does the size matter? <clears throat> because we would have to do it at a much greater scale. And um, I think that the, uh, the, the opportunity for failure would be much bigger. Uh, I have to say that <clears throat> one of the features of this 
um, long emergency, this, this set of changes we face, is that really anything that is organized at the giant scale is going to uh, be subject to failure, whether it's a gigantic national government, a gigantic university, a gigantic global corporation, um, you know, a gigantic sports franchise uh, league, you know, anything that's organized at that scale is going to get into trouble. The major trend that we got to keep in mind is that things got to get smaller and things have to get more local. Uh, it's, it is the way things are going. And it's one of the reasons that I find the World Economic Forum uh, project to be laughable because it's based on all this centralized power. And that's absolutely contradictory to what the real trend is, which I've just described. Well, so I mean, not, I don't really, like the World Economic Forum doesn't really have a policy or anything. They're, they're just like a people. Oh, they have opinions. a policy. They just don't have any enforcement. You know, right. they don't have an army. They, so they don't, don't really matter. They're kind of irrelevant. They, they have no relevance. They're not going to do anything. They're incapable of doing anything. Well, no what they have been doing is seeding, uh, seeding people in leadership around the, the world and creating a great deal of mischief by doing that. Well, it's, you know. it's, they're just unimportant to the conversation. They can't do anything. So I'm, but I'm curious about why do you think things are going to get smaller? Cause it seems like, um, given what I know about the technological advancements we do have, it seems like we have a pretty good means to supplement our coal and oil. Cause we have enough coal and, or enough oil and natural gas to last at least 50 years, given our current consumption rate. Uh, coal for another 120 years or something along those lines. Um, and within that time period, we already have nuclear fission, um, which is nuclear power plants, which could be used to supplement a great deal of the energy. And fusion is on the horizon. We're already making tokamak and other kinds of things that are pretty pretty fast going to come up as a positive source of energy. And Well, that's an assumption. That, that I, I'm not... I, I wouldn't buy that assumption necessarily. Yeah, you, you know, they, they haven't really, they've demonstrated uh, uh, fusion a few weeks ago, or they reported on it, uh, you know, occurring for a fraction of a second. And uh, I uh, am skeptical that that scales up to anything useful at this point. So really, we, we really have to, you know, stand by on that. And, you know, the, the problem is, is that, this set of quandaries that we face are deeply destabilizing. And so they're, you know, we're facing a situation where there are going to be a lot of things that we've gotten used to um, utilizing as tools to do the kind of thing that you're proposing that are not going to be exactly available to us anymore. And like probably what? like capital, like, like capital, we've, we, we have succeeded in screwing up the, uh, uh, the, the, banking engine that uh, creates capital. And, you know, we've done it in a fairly straightforward way in the United States, but, and to some extent in Europe too, by uh, changing out a, an economy that actually made things of value to an economy of financialization, which uh, to, you know, is largely a lot of uh, uh, interest rate fuckery and playing games with money. It doesn't produce things of value. And, uh, you know, we've accomplished this by running up tremendous amounts of debt, which are never going to be paid back. And the fact that it is the fact that we're now at a place where we know that the debt has no plausible way of being serviced or paid back, that the banking system can't function the way it has before. That's one of the reasons that, you know, we're faced with this prospect of a great reset well why does that because, matter because my understanding because is you need that... capital you need you need real capital to make things happen and capital is a real thing it's not a figment it's not you know it has to represent real things of value and um you know well, so, largely so question about largely, the, debt thing. Hmm? the debt thing seems like what makes debt work is the confidence people have that they're going to receive an annual or monthly income or dividend from the debt. The number of the debt is irrelevant. No one cares. As long as you get, you're maintaining well, that you're going to get a monthly income. That's all that matters. And that's why as debt increases, 
it doesn't have a proportional impact on interest rates because people don't care as long as they're getting their monthly dividends. And so it, the way that I've heard from economics econ economists about solving the debt problem that's in the hundreds of trillions or whatever of the just global, all of the kinds of debts that there are that we just don't even know about. Um, most of it can just be forgiven and no one's really going to care as long as it doesn't impact their monthly dividends. Uh, and so I think well, that- it's already impacted their, div their, not their dividends, their interest, uh, you know, their, their yield for years, for, for, you know, more than, more than a decade in the USA, people have gotten no real value out of holding bonds and now they're blowing up. And, and, you know, when they do, all of a sudden you're faced with some very severe problems with currencies and with the with the credibility of currencies and with the uh, uh, inability to generate new debt, especially sovereign debt. When, uh, you know, people lose faith in the tre U.S. treasuries that they're holding and, uh, you know, we're in a we're in a pretty bad situation with our bonds and with our debt generally. Uh, a certain amount of the debt that you're referring to may actually be represented by uh, derivatives, which, you know, an additional problem with banking right now is that we've created so many levels of abstraction between real value and real production and, and uh, you know, f uh, hallucinated value that, yeah, you could argue that uh, dismissing a quadrillion dollars worth of hallucinated money uh, is fine because it's hallucinated. But, you know, that, that's going to thunder through the economic system. And, and that's exactly the kind of thing that can bring banks down, including central banks. So uh, I, you know, I would just maintain that we're entering a... a period of great instability in banking and finance, and therefore a period of great problems and shortages and scarcity of real meaningful capital. And, and uh, you know, uh, one of the things that we disrupted and destroyed with uh, zero interest rate policy uh, was the time value of money. And, and, um, and, and, Coincidentally, also uh, price discovery or concurrently uh, price discovery. So the main functions of capital markets have really been impaired very badly. And going forward, our ability to uh, generate capital and create capital is going to be impaired. Why and and it's not going to be. That's one of the reasons that nuclear is such a problem, because uh, building nuclear reactors reactors is really a very expensive proposition. And the money is not going to be there. We're going to be shocked to discover that it's just not. We may schematically understand that we can build. We know how to build reactors and we know that we've made them better than they used to be. But it doesn't mean that we're going to have the capacity to to actually build them. So I, I, I think the stand capacity by is going to go like, where do you, th why do you think we're not going to have capital as you put it? As I said, because um, the, the, the problems that we have with debt right now are, uh, and also other things like geopolitics, which are also greatly destabilizing. They are destabilizing the banking system, the monetary system. Uh, they're destabilizing the bond uh, markets, they're destabilizing currencies. And, uh, you know, this, it's, a, uh, it's become a very financially fragile world. It's going to have to reset in some way or other. Uh, you know, the, the, the dollar at some point in the next 10 years is not going to be the world's reserve currency anymore. And when that happens, we're going to lose a great deal of advantage that we've enjoyed uh, over the last several decades. So there are, there are, in finance and banking, there are many, many things in motion now that, that all lend themselves to tremendous disruption and disorder. And it's not good. You need, you know, the, in order to make, especially in order to make a debt-based system work, you need a certain amount of confidence and order that uh, contracts that you make uh, now are going to be valid in, in one year, 
three years or five years or 10 years or 30, 20 years, you know, and, and, and bonds are denominated and, you know, by terms of time. Well, what and specifically... people can't have confidence now that, that, uh, that these things are going to be, have, have any value. Well, what specifically do you think is going to happen that's going to make them not have value? Because to me, it seems like they're still pretty reliable. Bonds still seem to be one of the most reliable sources of just income ever. Um, it's not when they like... don't pay in. Not when they don't pay interest. I mean, it'd be nice if they. Yeah, they're great when they're paying five, seven percent interest. Uh, you know, and th that's great. But they haven't been for more than a decade. You know that that's what zero interest rate policy is. Yeah, but they they're still worth something. They're not like going. They're not depreciating. Not really. No, them. that's what the that's what what that's what the real interest rate means. The real interest rate is the interest rate minus the inflation rate. Yeah. So if you have an interest rate, uh, let's say the ten year bond now yeah. is at uh, three point six percent, but you have uh, let's say a, a seven or eight percent inflation rate, that's a, a negative yielding bond. You know that that bond is you know yielding something like negative three and a half, four percent. So uh, and that's been the case for quite a while. And that's deeply destabilizing to the bond market and to lending and to debt based currency. So, you know, I don't want to get too esoteric about this, uh, but, you know, you really have to have a uh, meaningful on the ground value producing economy to make that stuff work. It worked great for us in the 1950s and 60s, started to wobble in the 1970s, and for a reason, because of the energy problems we were encountering. Well, we I just reached... wanted to stick on the bonds for a second. So mm -hmm. the bond rate is like 7% right now, and the inflation rate is like 3%. No, so... the bond rate isn't. The 10-year bond, the ten -year bond is at 3.6%. Uh, if you go to Market Watch or some other index uh, page, you'll see. The, the, uh, the composite rate for I-bonds for November 2002 through April 2023 is 6.89%. Of what kind of bond is that? What is I-bonds. What, what... I-bonds? Composite rate for I-bonds issued from November 2022 through April 2023 is 6.89%. Well, I don't know. Treasurydirect.gov. You know... Are those uh, uh, those are inflation protected bonds? Is um, that what you're talking about? Inflation indexed bonds? Maybe I don't know. Yeah, I think like, they are. I, even if even if we don't, that's what you're talking that. about. And and they they've been a thing for a long time. You know that we've had inflation indexed bonds that you know pretended to be a good investment, but if the if the rate if the if the rate on those bonds is 7% and the official inflation rate is 7%, when in fact it's a good deal more, it's actually more than that because the government lies about what the real inflation rate is. It's a, still a negative yielding bond. And that's the probably the best uh, U.S. Treasury rate that you can get is an, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a, an inflation index bond. But, you know, the standard, the, the hallmark bond is the 10 year treasury. And that uh, a lot of interest rates in all other things are calibrated off of that particular number. And that number is 3.6 today. And the inflation rate at a minimum is seven to eight percent, probably in real life a lot more, maybe more like 10, 12, perhaps even higher. Um, so, uh, I would have to conclude that you're you're not correct about this. Well, the inflation rate in November was seven point seven or seven point one, which is that was the from... that was the government's official number. But you know, the uh, they put out a jobs rate in June that was uh, uh, they had gained a million jobs. They reported that they had gained a million jobs, and uh, you know, the, the, I don't I don't remember how many quarters that was in the. Right. Yeah. What is that? But but it that? turned out they corrected that they, they corrected that a few weeks ago, and it turned out that they had only created ten thousand jobs, not a million jobs, and and uh, you know <clears throat> you cannot depend on the government reporting what these real figures are. They're do, they're do you have a not different real. place? Do you have a different place to have a more accurate number? Well, there are places all over the web where people who uh, uh, you know, affect to uh, have expertise in 
understanding these things. Um, they uh, report different numbers. And, and, and you're uh, saying that they're more trustworthy than the government, like individuals yes, doing individual absolutely. calculations that absolutely. vastly disagree with one another? Absolutely. Uh, I think the government at this point has demonstrated that it is wildly untrustworthy about just about everything. So I think that a collaborative institution who has multiple different individuals checking data um, for consilience is a more reliable source of data than a bunch of individuals doing their individual calculations that all. Yeah, you would disagree. think that you would think that. But, you know, when you when you impose over that a political agenda, <laughs> you know, that that all goes out the window. Just I don't saying. really I don't think they have a political agenda to lie about the inflation. Of course rate. they do. You don't Why? think the Biden administration has a political agenda to lie about the inflation rate? No, I mean the Republicans are, are absolutely more likely than that. Well, uh, we could argue about that for three days. It's my opinion is that the Biden administration, since it is in power, and it uh, it's going to be blamed for whatever does happen, they have a tremendous incentive to lie about uh, the the economic numbers and the financial numbers. <laughs> I think that you know if you said that. If you said that in any other, you know, reasonable forum or symposium with a bunch of people, knowledgeable people around, they'd laugh at that. They'd laugh at your your assertion that the government is is uh, reliable because they depend on a consilience of uh, uh, of a lot of experts. You know, if anything, you know, we're now in a crisis of expertise in American life generally, and especially in government. Well, I'd like to know more about the crisis of expertise, but I think that like all the data the government uses is public data. I don't, they don't have like, yeah, it's public data, data that they, that they, that they cook up. Cook up. So they, well, they you know, they, they, don't they, they overcook the it. Like they don't, they don't generate any of the numbers. The numbers are not like, no, frantic. that's you not true. Like, they, I'm going to reselect a new they number. They fuck like, with the numbers. Of course they do. Are you kidding? Are you, are you were you born last night? Like, at which stage of government do they fuck with the numbers? Does well, the Biden like I want a Bureau new number of labor statistics, you know, and go from there. The Treasury Department, uh, the Federal Reserve is not a government agency officially, but they lie about a lot of stuff. Uh, I, I would just say every every government department that has to report economic numbers doesn't do it accurately, and they're governed by an agenda that they have to uh, serve. And it's as simple as that. It's just really not that, this is not rocket science. And it's not arcane. Well, like the, the interest rates for a currency isn't like manipulated. It's relative to other currencies. You can't like, you can't make it up and be like, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna change the interest rate. And now the pound is worth less compared to the dollar just because the government fudged some numbers. like. Well, no, these are not interest rates. These are these are an interest rates you're talking about. They're comparative values of currencies on a, on a currency market. Yes, and so that's fudging different. the numbers that's not, in America, that's not interest. That's not interest. That's how many dollars it factor. takes. That's how many dollars it takes to get uh, you know pounds, and how many how many rupees it takes to to get a euro. That's that's has nothing to do with. That's not about interest. It is, it is about the relative value of the dollar, which is relative to interest rates. And so if we were lying about interest rates, other governments would be paying attention to this and their relative value of currency would be much we higher. Are, than we, dollar. we are. We are lying about interest rates. And that's why the BRIC countries are striving right now as we speak and have been for a couple of years to replace all of our uh, dollar-based operations, including the SWIFT system of, of trade settlement, they've been striving to change that out for their own system, which would be more, at least according to them, more honest than ours. You know, they've been fucked more, around more by our system. To Russia and China, who literally manipulate their currencies all the time, deliberately, openly, and you think that their, their trustworthiness of their currencies is somehow... It evidence. doesn't matter what I think. It matters what the other countries in the world think. If the other countries in the world think that they're getting fucked around by America, and I'll tell you the one thing that has really, really uh, uh, changed things in the last year is by 
confiscating the deposits of other sovereign nations in the U.S., as we did with Russia, you know, when when the Ukraine war started, uh, we, we confiscated about uh, half a trillion dollars in uh, Russian assets, financial assets. They That's don't typical trust for, for they, typical for war crimes. Like, yeah, they don't. Tr the rest of the world increasingly does not trust the financial operations of the U.S. And they are working diligently and sedulously to replace it with operations of their own. They're well, who, probably who, can, not can going to be. Me, can you tell me who which China, is, wait, India, wait, 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 Russia, other, other than BRICS, who I don't care about because they're literally manipulating currencies, other than the countries who are knowingly manipulating currencies of the honest countries, which ones are less trusting of the American dollar? Well, Probably all of the, you know, everybody outside of the Western Civ orbit. And let's remember, Western Civ being Europe, North America, Australia, New Zealand, basically, and Japan. And um, South Korea, North South Korea. Um, yeah, maybe. Others. Yeah, sure. South Korea, too. Throw them in. But uh, outside of that, uh, outside of th that axis, and, and believe me, uh, all of these different regions and countries have problems of their own. Europe, sure. Europe is probably financially more fragile even than the United States because uh, the, the euro system uh, does not provide any fiscal control uh, for the uh, European community or the European money system. You but know, that's a reason for them to trust the dollar more, isn't it? So if they're more fragile, they're probably putting oh, more weight. Oh, there, there, there may be, yeah, the, the, the Europeans may trust the dollar more because their system is more fragile. But their economies are blowing up now because they made the foolish decision to join the U.S. in their uh, Ukraine project. And uh, so, you know, Germany is uh, faced with deindustrializing itself, having cut itself off from affordable Russian gas and oil and uh you know that it's going to follow in the other nations too with you know with uh, the netherlands and the uk and france germany uh you know and, and the lesser economies they're all going to be in terrible trouble and especially germany well, and that, that uh, and like that what that tells me is that the european banking system is going to probably blow up before the American banking system does. And that's one of the reasons that the, Amer the stock market has been attracting a lot of investment in the last you know, year, because the Europeans know this and that they're, what, whatever, what remains of their capital is fleeing to what they consider to be a safer place. But it doesn't mean that the United States is a really safe place. It just means compared to Europe, it may not be quite as bad, but it's very bad. So. Well, you made the Ukraine sound like it was an economic policy or an economic uh, decision of some kind instead of war crimes by Russia. And so, yes, the fact that lots of countries are turning it away. was largely an economic war. And, it, you know, it's <clears throat> well, I, I, the war crime story is absurd. Russia literally <clears throat> invaded a country and tried to take it. That's that's a war crime. Um, well, you know, uh, uh, we have we have committed uh, plenty of crimes by sure interfering in Ukraine's uh, uh, government for uh, since 2014 and earlier, you know, and and uh, 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 provoking the 2014 color revolution and installing the leaders that we wanted to have, and then fucking with the Russian speaking provinces of ukraine to the degree and then threatening to bring ukraine into nato uh you know Which they the, have the right to do because they're an independent well country. they no they don't have the right to do that you know they, yet they literally have the right to if they're their own country they literally have the right to join nato independently of anybody else to say so because they're their own well country. we yes, made an agreement right. we made an agreement in the 1990s with russia when they were when they were uh uh you know in a state of near collapse themselves we made an agreement not to uh, extend the borders of NATO, uh, extend NATO to to the borders of Russia. And we did exactly that. We didn't keep our promise. And now they have drawn a line in the sand. They said, you know, we're not going to let you expand it to to uh, Ukraine's border with Russia. And, you know, you're you seem to be unaware of the fact that uh, 
you know, Ukraine has Ukraine was actually part of Russia for about three centuries. Sure. It was uh, only in a period that. from about 1954 or 55 or six uh, until uh, uh, 20, uh, excuse me, 1990 that, uh, uh, you know, excuse me, it was only from from 1990, 1991 or so to 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 present that Ukraine was not part of Russia. So, and uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it was this province of the well, Soviet no, wh Union. Why does that matter? Like if I just take a because bowl... it's their sphere of influence, no, nations, none, none of that matters. great none powers. Of that matters. Yeah, if it I does matter. No, it does matter. If I ask the population, great nations have if I ask of the population influence. of Ukraine today, if they democratically would like to be not a part of Russia and the majority of people in Ukraine do not want to be a part of Russia, that is the only thing that matters. I don't care about any of the history. Do the people of Ukraine want to be a part of Russia? The answer is resoundingly no. They don't. They want to be an independent nation. They want to be a part of NATO. They have every right to do every one of those things. Russia has mis misled us on many, many of their agreements. So the fact that NATO, we, we agreed many, many years ago not to expand the border of NATO is just irrelevant. Nobody cares. The only well, thing that matters is do the you know, Ukrainian you people have just about everything that you don't like to be irrelevant, but it's not irrelevant. And and you know, look at we how look, we have a thing in the America, we have a thing in our country how, called the Monroe how is, Doctrine. How okay? is that more that, relevant that, than the people of Ukraine? The Monroe Doctrine says I don't care. How is that more relevant than the people of Ukraine? How is that more relevant than the people care. of Ukraine you democratically wanting to be not Russian? That's the only thing that matters. That's the literally the only thing that matters. No, it Do isn't. the people this of is, Ukraine this is want to be in Russia? No politics. Tom is geopolitics. It's not about their feelings. This is about this their country. Lives. Th their this lives. this yes, place, Ukraine, is. has created a tremendous amount of mischief in that region of the world for the last in six every years. Region. That's and the Russians decided doing. that they had enough of that mischief. They need to turn that place into a part of the a region that's not going to cause trouble for that's them war or for that's the rest of the world. And they're that's in the process of doing it. It's and they're going to do it. And that's why everyone's going against them, because it's a war crime and it's illegal and it's immoral and they're well, mass murdering people. That's a war crime. That's well, why we just disagree about them. this. We disagree about Ukraine. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what's going to happen. Russia is going to go in there over the next several months. They're going to wipe up the floor with the Zelensky re regime. They're going to pacify this place. And that's going to that's how it's going to end. Uh, and then Ukraine is not going to be a problem for the rest of the world. Well, they're, they're kind of getting their ass kicked um, if you have. Well, noticed. that's that's not really true either. What is true? It's it's specifically true uh, because of the anti-tank missiles. The Javelins have uh -huh. been destroying the Russian tanks and Russian tank technology doesn't have the defense mechanisms to protect their tanks from Javelins. Uh -huh. They're getting their ass kicked because. We well, look, Javelins. there's probably been a lot of losses on, on both sides, but much more on the Ukrainian side. They're out of they don't have anything left. To, you know, and that's one of the reasons that Zelensky, you know, came to the U.S. to do that uh, vaudeville act last night in front of Congress. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, now we're going to give him another 50 billion dollars and we're going to, you know, we're going to give him uh, a lot of uh, a lot of weapons that they don't know how to use that we're going to have to pretend we're going to have to pretend that they're using. But we're really going to be using them, you know, like Patriot missiles. And the Russians are going to take out the Patriot missiles before they can even launch any Patriot missiles because they're easy to take out. So, you know, you, you have been listening. Why, why didn't to they too do much... that with the Javelins? Well, Javelins are much smaller missiles. They, they deploy differently. Hold on. I'm doing a podcast, hon. I can't talk to you right now. Give me a little more time, okay? Yeah. So, you know, Javelin's a different weapon system, you know, uh, uh, much easier to hide, much easier to, easier to deploy. You know, Patriot missiles uh, operate out of easily detectable batteries that are take, uh, they're, they're laborious to set up and they're easy to find with, uh, you know, satellite imagery and, and other things. So that, this isn't just not going to work. So I don't think this is an argument that we're going to succeed in clarifying anything about. We, you know, I think that you've been susceptible to a lot of propaganda and I haven't been. And that's, you know, where we'll have to leave it for the moment.
Well, yeah, I think that we should base our beliefs off of the evidence we have and not propaganda. And it seems like the evidence right. currently is that Ukraine is winning. Okay, well, we'll stand by on that and see how it works out. Okay, I'm content to do that. For sure. Um, there was a super chat. One sec, where is it? Um, Nathan Collins asks, why does he think Russia invaded Ukraine? Why do you think Russia? Well, I already Ukraine? said that. I think that, you know, after the 2014 color revolution that, that uh, uh, got rid of a president of Ukraine who was leaning towards joining the uh, Russian based customs union, a trade uh, a trade uh, union. We got rid of him and then uh, a series of new presidents. And, you know, they have been uh, shelling, harassing and firing uh, ordinance into those eastern provinces uh, called the Donbass and killing a lot of people and creating a lot of problems. And um, uh, and then accelerating, you know, the, the U.S. accelerating the problem by uh, attempting to expand uh uh, NATO to the Russian border. And uh, Mr. Putin had enough of that and he drew a line in the sand and now he's acting on it. And, um, you know, I, I, if you actually read his speeches, you know, you, you'll you discover that, uh, you know, he he states his case yeah, pretty who? clearly and pretty plainly, unlike unlike our people. His, his speeches who? His Putin? Yeah, his speeches to an international audience. They're worth paying attention to. Just especially co especially compared to uh, to our leaders who are nearly incoherent. Gosh, I was just clarifying which president you were talking about. I wasn't sure Putin. if it was Linsky or president Putin. Putin. Gotcha. Uh, Tim West, thank you for the super chat. Uh, James, do you happen to have aluminum foil under your winter hat? Just kidding. No, Stay I warm. don't. I don't. We're, you know, what we're seeing here are two different... Uh, that We're seeing very clearly the two two different political sides that are, you know, more or less uh, at war with each other in our own country, you know, the left and the right. And um, as I started out saying, you know, I'm, I've been a registered Democrat since the McGovern campaign in 1972. But uh, lately, uh, I've, I've had to uh, identify the Democratic Party as the party of chaos, because I think that's what they represent. And, um, you know, we're on different sides. Well, and, I'm a centrist, uh, so I think. Well, you affect to be a wrong. centrist. I wouldn't necessarily say that you are one. Well, I don't I know you well enough. But at this wrong. point, based on what you've said so far, I think that you're just buying a lot of uh, uh, government horseshit that's not worth um, paying attention to. Uh, well, you, you can definitely think that. Um, thank you for the super chat. e -font. What are his views on Zihan end of globalization? Uh, you know, I don't follow Zihan very much. Uh, um, I've only seen one or two of his, his uh, videos, and um, I, I wouldn't dismiss him because I don't know that much about him. I know that he's a figure on the scene, but, but uh, I haven't paid a whole lot of attention to him. Who is Zihan? I've never heard of him. He's a, he's a blogger, podcaster, Peter Zion. I believe gotcha. that's who they're talking about. Gotcha. I don't think he's a uh, bad guy. I, I, I just don't know exactly what his positions are about things. So it wouldn't be fair to say anything about him. Yeah, I've never heard of him. So I, I have no opinion one way or the other. Um, Chad Warble asks, do either of you agree with Elon Musk that a problem is under, that the problem is underpopulation? I, I, I don't know that I'd necessarily agree with that. I, I don't really believe we're going to have the ability to feed the the number of people that are on the planet now. I, I'm not a, I don't want to, you know, I'm not a depopulation advocate. I, I you know, I don't want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're kind of seeing something that smells like a genocide with um, the mRNA vaccines and they're pretty troubling. And, um, you know, that seems to be something that a lot of people promoted. Um, and uh, uh, I, I think we generally do have a population problem, but it'll be self-correcting. Uh, human beings have a certain lifespan 
and uh you know there will be some attrition and you know the the planet will correct itself i i don't want to help it along by trying to exterminate people which i think is something that is going on by who specifically well by what appears to be a coordinated uh a set of actions across uh many countries you know the there's a, a program now that uh, to uh, eliminate nitrogenous fertilizers from the farming scene in Europe. And the Dutch are pursuing that very aggressively. The Germans are too. The Dutch are closing down thousands and thousands of farms, or trying to anyway. And uh, these are going to lead to food problems in Europe. You can be sure. Uh, Canada has uh, done the same. They have the same policy or a similar policy. And the United States may be next. Um, you know, there are strange coordinated things going on all over the world. The, the vaccine mandates were coordinated through all of Western Civ and, and even in, you know, in Asia and, and other parts of the world. So just to clarify, uh, you're saying that they're doing that deliberately to kill people by starving them to death. Oh, uh, the the fertilizer thing, I think is, yep. I wouldn't say, put it that quite that harshly. I would say that, uh, you know, they're, they are obviously creating problems with the food supply that are going to show up, you know, very shortly down the road in a year or two, or, you know, see, uh, in a matter of seasons. Uh, I think that the vaccine policy uh, looks pretty odious. It looks like, uh, it, you know, it looks like the authorities know that it's harming people, but they won't stop pushing it. That's the main tell in the story, that they continue to push it despite the figures that show that the vaccines are killing and injuring a lot of people. So uh, that, that appears to look like a deliberate program. And, uh, you know, talk about government figures being uh, unreliable. The CDC figures are just, you know, the, the, their figures are ridiculous. And they, 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 they don't even want to look and see what the numbers are. Which numbers? The numbers of uh, all causes deaths, for example. I think those numbers are pretty accurate because COVID rarely causes death in those cases it's, it's not covid it's the vaccines the vaccines it's the vaccines that are a problem the vaccines are the vaccines are causing a lot of all causes deaths above the the uh what has been the normal number uh of deaths a percentage of deaths and and uh also tremendous numbers of injuries and we're ignoring it we're not paying any, any attention to it and it's going to matter a lot you'll find out tom you know, you're well, no, no, I, I already know that's attention. partially true, but it's still less than COVID. So obviously, no, it's not less than COVID. I, I would what? argue that it's not less than COVID. What? In fact, I think what we're discovering right now, and I think this is another inflection point in the story and in you know the history of the whole COVID nineteen episode, is that we're discovering that more people are being injured and killed by the vaccines than by the disease itself. What, what? I don't, how, I don't even, you don't do know you... about it. Well, I don't know. You're not paying attention. What can I say? You know, you're not paying attention. Pay attention. Yeah. Cause like 400,000 people have died from COVID in America. What, what do uh -huh. you, if that many people died from the vaccine, we notice like that's ridiculous. Yeah. We're pretending not to notice. Where, where are all the bodies? Where are the bodies of these? They're, right now they're people? going either underground or, you know, they're underground. Or they're, or they're being, uh, you know, cremated, as many people like to do these days. You know, that's where the bodies are going. They're going to the funeral parlors. They're, go you know, the funeral business is, is turned into a boom industry. How, the, how insurance, extra... the insurance industry is being crippled by the number of, of payouts they have to make for younger people who have died. I know you're laughing at this. You know yeah, why? Because yes. you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Well, wh where you are really the 400,000 bodies? You're not paying attention, Tom. If, if you you're say living in some kind you, of a You just said something so insanely dumb. Like you said that the vaccine is killing more people than yes. COVID. Which yeah, means that right. there has it to be is. an extra invisible set of 400,000 dead possible? bodies no longer going to work. To we can count the number of dead bodies. We know how many yeah. people have died. We can say 400,000 people have died yeah. from COVID, which makes up the vast majority of excess deaths in America. So if you're saying there's another 400,000 excess deaths in America yeah, that probably nobody least, noticed. Yeah. 
what did, did people just stop committing car crashes or something and that just balances out in the end like where did this extra four hundred thousand go why is it not in the data um, anywhere you're, look at you're not paying attention that's all you're not paying attention to the story you're saying there's double as many deaths as are yeah. reported yeah it, probably at least i don't i don't even know how to calculate that um, well, you know, look at the insurance, look at the actuarial figures and, and look at look at the uh, look at the uh, funeral home uh, stocks for the chains of funeral homes. Just start. F funeral homes are still extremely pop, like profitable. I don't know what you're talking have about. Have a look at ha have a look at the uh, uh, videos on Rumble that uh, Edward Dowd has put out. Have you seen any of them? I, I have no idea who that is. Yeah, you're not paying attention. You know, you've uh, got I, I a paper bag over your tables. head. Yeah, I, I use you, you've got papers. a paper bag over your head. Yes, paper as in academic papers instead of Infowars papers. Right, academic papers, right. From Kurt I mean, reading has... like from the Lancet and the AMA Journal, you know. Well, uh, these these are captured, captured journals that have been publishing lies for the last three years. Using double-blind peer review? How do you publish No, no, using, using peer-reviewed... Peer peer-reviewed, janky uh, articles in peer-reviewed uh, journals. So have you and published an academic journal? Do you know have I, I'm not an yes. academic. So, so I'm I, a journalist I, I, and a novelist. I'm not an academic, but I've actually submitted papers for review. Well, goody for know, you. Well, well, so I know the process. It's called okay. a double-blind well, peer we know that it's We know that it's arduous. We know all about that. But when, it, ar Arduous doesn't matter. What matters is, is that they remove your name and your credentials. Nobody uh -huh. knows anything about you when you publish the paper. They don't get to know who wrote them or what they said. It's just to test the data. It tests the data. How do you lie about that? How do you submit a double-blind peer-reviewed paper to a journal, which then just tests the data? You lie the about price? the numbers. Do you think that do you think that the uh, do you think that Pfizer and Moderna do you think Pfizer especially was honest about its drug trials? The ones that they had to publish the data to the governments too, because if they didn't, they'd be sued. Yes, yes, they do you were. Think they were honest. Yeah, the, yes, they had to be. They literally had to give you all of the data to the government because it was literally what they were paid to do. Yes, and the, I I actually know. Some of the institutions who were testing COVID here and there were universities like University of Minnesota who was doing the COVID tests for these companies. Yes, most universities are the ones doing the, the tests. How could how could Pfizer lie to the government about the tests being done by the universities? Where well, the data you'll have to stand by Pfizer? on that because I think I think you're going to discover that they were lying. Um, Kurt Hahnemann asks, Jim, do you watch InfoWars? Thank you for the super chat. No. I do not either. Um uh nathan collins asked how does he determine which government data to trust well at this point the government has been has proven so untrustworthy over the last five years well, i think it means like they, russia they versus... would have to they would have to really they you know i like, think that uh, we're gonna have to, i think we're gonna have to have some fair proceedings public proceedings trials lawsuits um, and other public forums for adjudicating who who has said what and and what is real because you know this country is laboring in in a, a morass of unreality and uh, it, it has to be adjudicated and it probably will you know it'll begin in Congress in less than a few weeks and we're going to begin to see people having to testify about things that really matter what about different governments like Russia versus China versus Brazil versus U.S.? How do you? Well, we do which... the best we can. We do the best we can analyzing uh, the difference between what they say and what they do, and and at some point, you know, you have to come to a conclusion about what the reality of that is, and uh, you know, there's no question that that uh, Russia and China uh, lie about a lot of stuff, but um, I my guess is that uh, China is probably at this point more dishonest than russia is well what is but it, that's just uh, what is, uh, you know comparative you say comparing what they say and what they do what is it that yeah. america is saying but not doing that makes you distrust the american government 
Well, uh, you know, it, it's such an, an enormous subject, but, you know, starting with uh, surveilling the population, uh, because that's been in the news so, so vividly just for the last month since uh, Elon Musk has been uh, uh, releasing the, the, you know, the information about what went on at Twitter. And uh, so we know they can't be relied on uh, about what they're surveilling and, you know, how much information they're collecting about us and what they're doing with it. Um, uh, I think the entire Russiagate episode, uh, starting from 2016, showed that the uh, Justice Department and the FBI was uh, deeply dishonest. And um, that remains to be adjudicated, never was really. Um, the 2020 elections, I think, included a certain amount of uh, 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 election fuckery that, uh, you know, we may or may not ever find out about. But, uh, you know, I think that it, from what I've seen, I believe there was quite a bit of it. <clears throat> and um, I think there's plenty of reason to believe that uh, the American people uh, are being consistently lied to about important things. And uh, if you stand by and wait for the, you know, 2023, I think we're going to start discovering what some of those things are that we've been lied about lied to about certainly about the vaccines certainly about uh yeah i mean if you don't think that the government was lying when they said that the vaccines were effective you know that's just a basic fundamental thing that they said that they maintained for you know a few months until they changed it and then started walking it back until now they they admit that it's not effective and uh in fact it only seems to be effective at killing people and injuring them so now look so from at, uh, look at um, I think I agreed to come on an hour podcast. Uh, I've got I've got things that I got to do today. Cool. And uh, and so I just can't stay here any longer. But it's been interesting. And, yep. uh, uh, you know, you I'll be curious to see where you stand six months from now. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Do you want to give any links or references where people can find? Well, out I publish a uh, political blog called Clusterfuck Nation twice a week on Monday and Friday. It comes out before ten o'clock Eastern time on Monday and Friday, and uh, you know my books are on my website, which is kunstler.com. You probably, if you're watching the show, you can probably see how my name is spelled, and that's how to find what I'm writing about. Awesome. Thanks again. Really appreciate it. And hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Okay, Tom. You too. See you. Adios.